civil danger warning. A disaster of unknown type has occurred. Number of casualties are not yet known. Outbreak of a highly contagious virus. Normal programming has been suspended. Stay calm and stay indoors. Gary. Gary, just keep smacking it. This is not a test. Keep flexing to keep that blood pumping. The capacitor is charging. Okay, great. Let's get started. The Glorious Free Republic of Yorkshire Radio Show. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Glorious Free Republic of Yorkshire radio show. Gary has connected his veins to the blood fuel dynamo pump and we should have enough power for around half an hour. So we'll be bringing you government approved news and stories from Free Yorkshire, the mightiest of the many new nation states that, several decades ago, emerged from the troubled era that was 21st century Britain. My name, of course, is Lloyd Becklesnip and we have a packed show for you tonight. Coming up soon, the third part in a short series of reports about how our food gets from farm to table. We'll be meeting Max Frittle and learning about his exciting new plans to distribute swamp mongrel. We've gone into the community, we've brought a real range of, I think they're formerly used as dentist chairs. They have manacles, they'll hold you down so you're completely safe, you can't move. There's no risk of it being forced into your cheek or your your abdomen or, or God forbid a nipple. And later, in our regular feature, Spotlight On, we'll hear from Permit Officer Penny Wilkinshire. She'll be telling us all about how easy it is to apply for government shopping permits. So basically submit your shopping list, extra double spacing, and only in vermilion. And you'd have to supply photographs of any people who might be eating the shopping. And if there's time, we may even pay a visit to Dale Wolfe at the sports desk. But first, here's the latest traffic report. All the coastal roads are still suffering from minor jellyfish avalanches, so check that your vehicle seal is airtight before any seaside journeys. The three-month tailback between Skelmanthorpe and Roydhouse has devolved into a tribal society, so make sure you have a spare child to barter with if you're heading that way. And the M62 is still missing, and we'd like to keep it that way, so if you see it, just keep stum, okay? Now it's time for the third in our series, From Farm to Table. And this time I went to visit Max Frittle, who runs one of Yorkshire's largest supermarkets. And here's what happened when I got a glimpse behind the curtains of retail. Good afternoon, Max. Good afternoon, Lloyd. So can you take us through step by step how you take a, a swamp mongrel carcass and process it into the delicious looking cellophane wrapped hunk of meat that we see on our shelves every day basically we we look after the entire end-to-end process we take it from our end to your end the swamp mongols come in and we use giant pumice stones so they're essentially really pumice down to um well, we call it a delicious paste. And are they deboned before, or are the the bones pumiced in with the flesh? It's important not to waste anything when you have a product as delicious as a swan mongrel. So the pumice stones basically grind the bones to a, f- a really fine paste, so you're not losing any of that bony flavour at all. It's right in there. There, there sometimes are little remnants. Uh, we call them snippets of bits that do need to be removed. So. Some of the hairs, we have a very large tweezer, so they, they mm-hmm. will be tweezered off. The, the, the swamp mongrel hair is very uh, fibrous. You know, it's part of its defense mechanism, so if you get one of those stuck in your throat, yes, the only way to get it out is a tracheotomy. Yes, and that, that has happened mm-hmm. many times. Despite the fact that you're mashing it into a kind of glutinous paste, you still have your top end swamp mongrel paste and your low end swamp mongrel paste what is it that separates the top end from the low end paste wise it's more the after effects on the body so you're talking about a grade of uh, indigestion effectively Mm -hmm. so you can expect a very high level of indigestion on on the on the perhaps the we don't like to use the word cheaper so perhaps uh, more fibrous cuts of meat this will pass after just a matter of days really as will the bleeding yes the bleeding does subside Nothing to worry about, and we of course sell a range of particularly fibrous underwear uh, derived from the swamp mongrel as well in all of our branches. And given that the the swamp mongrel's own blood is 
almost a match for ours. You're almost certainly to get more blood than you'd lose. You're never in deficit, or at least for long anyway. And so you've got a special promotion on this week. Would you like to tell me a little bit more about how you're getting the local community school children involved in the promotion of this week's Swamp Mongrel? We were looking through some of the remnants we were able to access on, on, on historical promotions and mm-hmm. found some initials at B-O-G-O-F. Uh, which I gather meant buy one, get one forced. So if you as a, a parent buy a delicious cut yourself, we will, you know, force one on the child. Well, it's a fine tradition. You know, I remember my first forced swamp mongrel. Yes. It was traditionally on your seventh birthday. Yes. You would get done up in your best bib and tucker and then the plastic sheeting with the neck hole. And the industrial solvents, of course. And, you know, you'd open your mouth wide for the, the, as it was then, raw swamp mongrel, the many deaths have let that part of it die away, but you would get raw swamp mongrel through a grinder and poured directly into your mouth to the point of almost choking. And then there would just be that moment where your resistance would break and suddenly you saw the way and the truth and the light of the swamp mongrel meat. So you're bringing back that tradition. We've gone into the community, we've brought a real range of I think they're formerly used as dentist chairs. They have manacles, they'll hold you down, so you're completely safe. You can't move. There's no risk of it being forced into your cheek or your your abdomen or, or God forbid, a nipple. This will go right into your mouth at some force. And we'll, we'll be going out to any community that will have us. And I, I think with a, us having that retail position that we do have as the you know, exclusive retailer that the communities will and indeed must accept us yes or the black fans will be showing up to anyone who does not take part in our wonderful voluntary celebration of culture oh god yes the glorious free republic of yorkshire radio show and we'll hear the rest of that fascinating report in a moment but first a word from this week's sponsor Unable to get a travel permit to go to your favourite supermarket? Being denied shopping vouchers for your preferred ingredients? Just feeling too sluggish after vomiting all night due to radiation sickness? Then Spew Apron has the solution for you. Get the exact ingredients for all your favourite meals delivered straight to your domicile. Making a swamp bog enough? We'll deliver the three swamp mongrels and two bustles of nettles required for this recipe. Or do you fancy some furritos? We'll deliver the two swamp mongrels and four bustles of nettles that make up this classic dish. And there's no need for any fancy foreign spices either, as the swamp mongrels pituitary gland has been left in for this one. The list just goes on. Scotch leg, seven mongrel legs, all left ones naturally, and a bag of shredded nettles. Yeti bolognese, one giant swamp mongrel already garlanded in a nettle sack. Hole in the toad, five infant swamp mongrel carcasses, all carefully stitched together via their eye sockets with a length of nettle twine. Mmm, mmm, I can almost hear you salivating at the thought of that one. And now, there's the pudding option. All your favourite treats are available, such as Eaton Mess, five pounds of reconstituted swamp mongrel gristle tightly packed around a nettle grenade. Just pull the pin when you're ready to party. Be careful opening that one. Seriously, please be careful. When you're in the kitchen and you don't know what to do, just call the apron that is labelled spew. Remember not to order any recipes that contain ingredients other than swamp mongrel or nettles, as we are then legally obliged to report you to the authorities. And now, back to our interview with supermarket supremo, Max Frittle. What's coming up in the exciting world of swamp mongrel? promotions as some would say and I, I don't know why they would say this that the meat is very hard so we've taken to pulping it and removing a little bit less of the fiber than we normally would and it can then be used as a, almost like a memory foam mattress it's going to be a memory foam range of, of the meaty mattress and, and waking up with a scent on your body mm-hmm. a meaty scent is 
Oh, well, yes, we've got the Swamp Mongrel perfume that's going to be launched in time for our Winterfell Festival, I believe. Oh, yes, uh, we're expecting a, a big commotion about that. It's going to be great. There were obviously issues in terms of getting a device that would force out with enough speed to disseminate the meaty vapour all over you. Well, I believe you've now developed one so powerful that one blast enters the skin effectively it's at a subcutaneous level yes and so you will hold on that scent for a month or two and i believe that it, this is safe to use all year round except of course during swamp mongrel mating season oh no no yes yes it'd be a, you must be careful during that time they are particularly enticed by that smell the hydraulic presses we use in the aftershave and the perfume you need to stand about 100 feet away and once it hits if you're too near you could be forced into to pieces but what do you say to the people who've been affected by it? They weren't standing too close, but they weren't quite far enough away. So it has altered their DNA. So they have started to develop some swamp mongrel tendencies. With any product, there's going to be a testing period and there's going to be a few broken eggs on the way to making a meaty omelette. Ultimately, if you have a coupon and you come in, we'll serve you. It doesn't matter about your DNA. We will be happy to serve you up delicious meat. Mm -hmm. But have you got your own loyalty card? Oh, absolutely. We launched these a few years ago. We gather the uh, were formerly very popular. And of course, the unique cardboard hole punch design is fantastic. So every time you come in, we'll punch a hole. And the 107th meaty product you buy, you'll get another one completely free and if you lose your card of course as you punch your hole because you have to have your card on your arm yes. there is a permanent record left on your arm anyway yes it guarantees that you will never miss out on that one bit of free meat after 107 purchases nobody misses out well thank you very much for your time max i look forward to my next delicious lump of slightly oozing gray pink flesh cannot wait thanks Lloyd. The Glorious Free Republic of Yorkshire Radio Show. What a revealing feature that was. It's good to know that none of our retail outlets will be discriminating against the new breed of swamp mongrel slash human hybrids that have been hitting the headlines recently. They will, of course, still need to apply for all the necessary permits to enable them to go shopping in the first place, something I'm sure they'll manage once their frontal lobes evolve to the point where they're capable of language. Until then... Hang in there, you swamp mongrelly cuties. We're all rooting for you. And to show you all just how easy it is to get a permit, in our next instalment of Spotlight On, I caught up with Penny Wilkinshire and learnt all about her role as a government permit officer. Penny, thank you very much for coming on the show. You're very welcome, Lloyd, and it's super to be here. So, Penny, lots of people get very confused and irritated by the process of having to get permits for shopping, parking, travelling, childbirth. The list goes on and on and on. But we'd like to reassure people that this is quite a straightforward process. So, for example, if somebody wanted to get a shopping permit to go shopping on a Friday afternoon, what's the first thing they would need to do? Did you say a shopping permit on Friday? A shopping permit on a Friday oh, afternoon. You're starting with a big one there, Lloyd. First of all, you'd have to submit your shopping list. We'd have to check that the items on the list were permitted to be bought on a Friday. That's the very first thing. No random items on the shopping list, only essentials. So basically submit your shopping list, extra double spacing, and only in the million. And you'd have to supply photographs of any people who might be eating the shopping. Each person has to declare what they like, what they don't like, and what recipes they might use the items in, because there's only certain recipes permitted on a Friday. So you'd have to do that first of all. Well, that all seems fair enough. Uh, what's the time frame? Is it now up to three weeks in advance before they apply for this permit? We've got it down to about six weeks now. So you do have to think ahead about the things that you might want to eat in six weeks time. We also require you to submit your passport details, if, photographs. If you've got a passport, that is obviously. Well, obviously you you, you, <laughs> well, yeah, you will have, have to have applied for your passport. And again, that is um, that's a process we've tried to simplify, but it's not it's not as quick as it used to be. That can take anything up to two years. So we sort of know how easy it is to get a shopping permit. But what if I was to do something that some people might say is a little bit more straightforward? I want to visit a neighbouring town. 
that's just beyond the three mile limit on daily travel and I want to go see my sick auntie who's going to be possibly dying within the week. How would I uh, go about arranging such a trip? It would be very extenuating circumstances, of course, where you'd have to bring your aunt in. You'd have to bring her in to my office, actually, and we would have to have our medical examiners confirm just how sick she really is. We'd have to examine her stools, her bile would have to be analysed, some quite specific probing and some medical testing to see if, basically, to be honest, Lloyd, to see if she was faking it. Uh, right, because just a couple of years ago, I, I believe the process was when I went to visit uh, my dying uncle, that all I had to do was send in six months' worth of x-rays, a recent biopsy, a hair sample, some skin scraping, and uh, he just had to cough onto the envelope as we were sealing it just to give it that extra bit of validity. But this system was being abused. You've hit the nail on the head there, Lloyd. Yes, it was being abused. People were sending in fake samples. They were um, picking up handkerchiefs in the streets. They were collecting stool samples from public toilets. All manner of fakery was happening. So we've we've simplified it. We also have to ascertain whether it is your aunt. So we uh, need, we'd need some DNA testing yes. as well because you could be just... You know, to be really honest, Lloyd, people will just, um, they'll kidnap people mm -hmm. just to, to get this permit. People will kidnap someone's poorly aunt. So quite simple, really. Just bring along the sick relative to my office. Obviously, if your office is more than three miles away from where the sick aunt is, they then have to apply for a travel permit to come and visit your office. How do you... Yes. Square that circle, so to speak. <laughs> yes, you're, um, you've picked up on another small matter there. There is the travel permit issue. Well, we tried to make that easy as well. You can apply for that just a few months ahead. So you would have to know, you know, obviously that your, your relative is going to be sick. Yeah. You'd have to have some medical training. OK. So if you have a slight cough or anything, best to get that travel application in now in case it develops into a full-blown illness. That's what we advise, you know, if you see a relative looking a little bit glassy eyed, mm -hmm. you know, don't just assume they're drunk. Yeah. Assume the worst. In all cases, really, assume the worst. I mean, that's our motto within the department. You can apply for that permit to travel. As I say, we're, we're trying to get the times down. Currently, it's a few months. By then, some sort of real illness hopefully will have developed. <laughs> The Glorious Free Republic of Yorkshire Radio Show. And we'll hear the rest of that report in a moment. But first, here's a little taste of what's also available to listen to on the Free Yorkshire Network. I'm Nathan. I'm Ethan. I'm also either Ethan or Nathan. I've temporarily forgotten. And I'm Lord Grizzleblood, purveyor of darkness. Each week on And The Frog Died, we take your favourite film and examine it in such detail that we manage to suck every last drop of joy from it, leaving it as a desiccated husk to be blown away with the rest of the cultural tumbleweed. I'll be digging up nuggets of trivia so obscure and pointless that your eyes will roll back into your head so far that they actually pop all the way around. Have fun untangling those optic nerves and I'll be using my twisted logic to try to convince you that everything you thought was good is in fact garbage, and everything that you thought was garbage is somehow a masterpiece. And even though you may find every word that crawls out of my mouth as disagreeable as a licorice flavoured turd, somehow my opinions will seep into your skin, leaving you unable to enjoy even the simplest of cinematic pleasures. And I will be feasting on your pain as your soul seeps out of your body. Yum, yum, yum. And the frog died. Because if we can't experience joy, then no one else should either. And now back to Penny. And just to end on a, a slightly lighter note, can you explain how easy it is for us to get one of our permits to allow our children to play in the local park? Because obviously we can't let our kids go running around willy-nilly having fun whenever they like. They need to get used to having these kiddie permits. So and I believe you're introducing a scheme where the kids apply for the permits themselves to get them used to the lifelong habit of having to fill out permit applications. You're right. Habits like these have to start early. The earlier you can, you know, 
train your children, the mm -hmm. better. We recommend a few months old, put a pen in their hand. You know, instead of sort of mobiles above the cot, just dangle a, a permit application form. And, and we do want to encourage children to play in the park. I'd say if you're looking for your child to go into a park at around about age, what are we talking here, Lloyd, seven, then start the process when they're about one. Because we don't want the parks full. That's the other issue. You know, too many children in the park, accidents. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, this has happened in the past, we believe. We've no statistics on that. We just believe it. So the process can take a few years. So just get used to being with your children most of the time. And what could be more fun than to have your child as a constant, almost unceasing burden on your everyday life? That's what we say, Lloyd. You know, it, it bonds people. It's just, it's the right way. Well, thank you very much for coming again, Penny, and for clearing up all that confusion. Thank you. Goodbye. Unfortunately, when double-checking the permits involved in the recording of this interview, I noticed that Penny had failed to dot the third I in her name on her living licence. And obviously, I had to notify the relevant authorities. This was, of course, Penny herself. But, dutiful woman that she was, she recognised the severity of her transgression and duly revoked her own living licence. So, I'd like to dedicate this episode to the memory of that pathologically obedient worker drone. Sorry, woman. What an inspiration she was to us all. Well, Gary has now gone whiter than the front row at a boy band concert, but if we're quick, I think we can squeeze in a trip to the sports desk with Dale Wolf. And Dale, this time you're going to give us all the latest updates in the world of flailing and twigs. Yes, the FTL, the Flailing and Twig League, is on fire at the moment. We're approaching the midpoint of the 15th cycle and the top spot is being determined by the Lexington Danglers and the Ghoul Grinders, who of course meet this weekend. Okay, and so this is their seventh meeting of the 15th cycle, so therefore they'll be doubling the sponge points in this fixture, but the Daxler effect is only at 50%. Oh, 60%, 60%. There, Lloyd. Sorry, how stupid of me. Keep your eye on the updates, but the sponge points are going to be, well, firmly in the gold grinders' corners. They are on form at the moment. However, to be honest with you, the more interesting stuff is happening a little bit further down the table with the Wet Wang Spoons and the Selby Teeth playing, well, at the Wet Wang Stadium. They've got home advantage, so the Leamington ruling will be in effect because they are in the bottom 30 percentile of the league, and so they can cross hatch their tickling in order to maximize the mammage. Took the words right out of my mouth there, Lloyd. Well, Selby teeth are literally hanging on by the skin of their proverbial teeth because they get lower than 20% wibbling in this particular fixture. They might be in for a penalty fixture. But of course, since they lost their last two games, they do have the buzzsaw advantage, which is probably going to get them out of this very tough jam. Though, of course, if they then lose three fixtures, they'll be able to use their triple jack bonus in the next fixture, and so they're not quite at death's door yet. No, definitely not. They are not going down without a fight. Of course, they're going to have the triple jack advantage, that along with the buzz saw fixture, well, it's going to be full-on Balamori this weekend. And of course, Rothwell United have already been relegated. Well, it's good to get a clear picture of what's happening in the FTL. We hope to be visiting with you again soon, Dale. Thanks, Lloyd. OK, Gary's fading in and out of consciousness, so I'd better unhook him from the blood pump. And I guess that's the end of another show. Cheerio, and until next time, may all your brews be strong, may all your puddings be fettled, and may all your swamp mongrels be radiation free. Tara! Communications have been severely disrupted. Make sure you have food, water, and a battery powered radio with you. This is not a test. Okay, hello. If you're still listening, you've reached the end, so thanks very much for making it all the way through. I'm Noel Curry, the guy who put all this together, and on this episode, uh, you also heard Ben Spencer, Mandy McCarthy, and Josh Wyatt. 
and we're all improvisers. We're in a group in Leeds in UK in England called Super Trooper Improv. So if you're in the area, please do look us up and check us out. Links to where you can find us will be in the description, along with links to any other things that our guests are involved with. So the plan is to stick one of these out every month, uh, but I only get around to doing this in my very limited spare time, so I'm not promising that I'm going to stick to that schedule. And with that in mind, uh, can I please just ask that you don't like or subscribe because the more people that do that, the more time I'm going to have to spend on making this sound actually good. So uh, that would be appreciated. And oh, for the love of God, don't rate and review it. That would be disastrous unless you hate me, you know, rate and review, share on Twitter, Facebook and all that. But if you're a friend of mine, you know what to do. Just leave well enough alone. Thanks very much again for listening and we'll be back again soon. The glorious free republic of your Radio Show.